My name is Ben Stone. I'm the director of the Economic Development Board. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today at our annual State of the County. There's 498 people in this room. We have a waiting list of 91. So thank you for persevering and being with us this morning. A new year brings a new board chair and 4th District Supervisor James Gore has lined up a new and exciting program for you today in response to the fires. Uh, for it, we'll begin with an outlook on the local, state, and national economies from UCLA economist Jerry Nicholsberg, followed by an innovative panel with representatives from the nonprofit, private, and public sectors and their plans for recovery in Sonoma County. A video hiding the resilience of the community, breakout sessions for which some of you pre registered that will help inform the county's recovery plan and the 2018 Economic Summit, which will be held in Sonoma County this fall. I'd like now to take a moment to thank our presenting sponsors that have helped support our economic development initiatives and events like these. You can see them on the placards on your tables and on the screen, uh, beginning with Luther Burbank Savings, City of Santa Rosa, Exchange Bank, Kaiser Permanente, PG&E, Pure Luxury, Redwood Credit Union, Sonoma Raceway, and Tri-Counties Bank. And our premier sponsors, the Bank of Marin, Employment Training Panel, Friedman Goldberg, Sonoma Clean Power, and St. Joseph's. At the executive level, American River Bank, Comcast, Keegan uh, Midstate Construction, Norbar, Keegan and Copen, Sonoma County Alliance, Summit State Bank, Wells Fargo Bank, Ventreo Insurance, and Zaner Reinhardt Clark. And at the media level, the North Bay Business Journal. Let's give them a round of applause for their support. <clears throat> I'd also like to welcome uh, the many city, state, and federal officials and their staff members here with us today. If they would please stand or wave as uh, we call their name so we can acknowledge and thank you for your dedication to public service. For the audience, please hold your applause until we get through the entire list. So let's start with our Board of Supervisors with First District Supervisor Susan Gorin, Second District Supervisor David Rabbit, Third District, Su David. <clears throat> Don't say it. Yeah. <laughs> Third District Supervisor Shirley Zane, who I hope got some coffee. Um, fourth District Supervisor James Gore, and Fifth District Supervisor Linda Hopkins. At the federal level, Congress, uh, for Congressman Jared Huffman, we have Blake Cooper, and for Congressman Mike Thompson, Stephen Gale. At the state level, Assembly Member Jim Wood is with us this morning, along with Senator Mike McGuire's representative, um, uh, Danielle Bradley, Assembly Member Bill Dodds, Representative Logan Pitts, and Cecilia Aguirre Curry's Representative Tracy Crumpen. For the City of Katati, we have the Mayor, Mark Landman. Uh, and for the City of Cloverdale, we have the Mayor, Joe Paula, and Council Member Melanie Bagby. For the City of Healdsburg, the Vice Mayor is here, David Hagel, along with Council Member Joe Najukas. City of Petaluma, the Mayor is here, David Glass, along with Council Member Dave King and Council Member Mike Healy. From the city of Rohnert Park, where this event is being held, the, uh, the mayor is here, Pam Stafford, along with Co Council Member Ami Ahanatu and Gina Belforte. For the city of Santa Rosa, we have the mayor, Chris Corsi, along with Council Member Ernesto Oliveras and Tom Schwedhelm. For the city of Sebastopol, the mayor is here, Patrick Slater. For the city of Sonoma, we have the mayor, Madeline Agramonte, and for the town of Windsor, we have the mayor, Deborah Fudge, along with council member, Dom Papoli, Mark Milan, and Bruce Krupke. From Sonoma State University, the president is here, Judy Sasaki. And from Santa Rosa Junior College, we have Frank Chong, the president. From the Sonoma County Office of Education, Steve Harrington. And the Sonoma County Board of Education, we have Juna Kuklis, Herman G. Hernandez, Peter Costas, Andrew Leonard, and Lisa Whitkey Schaffner. 
Anybody I've missed? Let's give them a round of applause. We also have two major anniversaries this year. Santa Rosa Junior College is celebrating its 100th anniversary. And the city of Santa Rosa, the city of Santa Rosa is celebrating its 150th anniversary. Let's give them a round of applause. As you're well aware, our community has suffered an unprecedented loss of life, property, and confidence in the future. But things are already getting better. For instance, throughout the county, there are 2,600 housing starts underway for 2018. This gets us to restoring half the housing we lost in the fires, and much more will begin in 2019. The theme of today's event is building hope and resiliency in Sonoma County. As so much has happened so quickly after the fires, it often has been difficult to understand and appreciate all the work underway to help our community rebound. Many tell us they don't know what's going on or if anything's being done for recovery here. To help address this, we have a series of speakers who will highlight recovery efforts underway and what we need to move forward. In that spirit, I'll be, provide a brief update on what the EDB has done in the aftermath of the fires. We've worked with the California Office of Economic Development to create a new $10 million disaster relief fund and loan guarantee program. We launched the uh, Creative Sonoma Recovery Fund for local creatives, which has raised over $200,000 in private money. Uh, at the direction of the Board of Supervisors, we launched the Go SoCo local campaign that promotes local shopping during the month of December in partnership with all the Chambers of Commerce in the county and the Press Democrat. This promotion just recently won the highest award in the state of California for economic development. Go on. <clears throat> Thank you. Going forward, Go Local Sonoma County, Rebuild North Bay, and others will continue this important work. We partnered with the City of Santa Rosa and Santa Rosa Metro Chamber to reach out to some of our largest employers and assist them with challenges created by the fires. Additionally, the EDB has developed a short-term recovery plan as part of our long-term economic strategic plan called Strategic Sonoma, co-chaired by Brett Martinez and Pam Chanter. This plan will be presented to the Board of Supervisors on February 13th. This will be a comprehensive action plan with an economic analysis of the fire's effect here, best practices to guide an effective recovery, and recommendations to move forward. This will be an important presentation, and I hope Many of you will be there on February 13th at the Board of Supervisors Chambers from 1.30 to 3. We need to hear from you on this economic recovery plan. This economic recovery plan will fold into the county's overall recovery plan as well as the new strategic Sonoma economic strategy. This five-year action plan will be unveiled at the spring economic breakfast on Thursday, May 10th, so mark your calendars now. Additionally, and in the vein of Shop Shop Local, Sonoma County Restaurant Week, there's the logo, the new logo is coming on March 2nd to the 11th. Our restaurants have been particularly impacted by the loss of tourism, and therefore they're really struggling right now. So we've extended the restaurant weeks by several days, so you all have a chance to go out and support local restaurants March 2nd to the 11th. All this is just the EDB's contribution to the recovery. The Workforce Investment Board is also taking active steps to assist recovery and has applied for a $3 million grant to assist dislocated workers displaced by wildfires. Grant activities will focus on assisting our workforce affected by the fires in their current industry or retrain them in the building and trades in an effort to assist them in learning new skills that will be needed in our community. The goal of the grant is to link individuals with employment opportunities that will provide livable wages and sustainable work that will keep these workers here in Sonoma County. And our construction folks really need these people. There's a lot of other incredible work going on here to help our community, and you'll hear from other speakers shortly about all the efforts. Next, I'd like to introduce, however, our fourth district supervisor, James Gore, the incoming chair of the Board of Supervisors for 2018 as he welcomes you this morning and lays out his vision for this year in Sonoma County. Born in Healdsburg and raised throughout the 4th District, he's a sixth generation Californian whose passions drive towards building a vibrant and resilient future for his community, his neighbors, and his family. 
Prior to his election as supervisor, James served as the assistant chief to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service. Supervisor Gore has also played an instrumental role in uh, bringing the California Economic Summit to Sonoma County in the fall of 2018. This event will bring business, nonprofit, and government leaders here around the state to address some of the most pressing issues affecting California's prosperity. It will be a, a bold and exciting year with Supervisor Gore at the helm, and today's event is the first example. We have an innovative and exciting program for you, all of you centered on building hope and resiliency in Sonoma County. We hope you leave here inspired, informed, and most importantly, hopeful for the future here in Sonoma County. Please join me in welcoming the Chairman of the Board of Supervisors, James Gore. James, good luck. Good morning, good morning. Buenos dias, buongiorno. Bonjour. Buenos dias. I want to thank you, Ben, so much. You know, he just finished by saying uh, that this is about his vision. And, um, and I think what you're going to see to say today with the state of the county is that that's not what I'm interested in at all doing as the chair of the Board of Supervisors. I'm not interested in my vision. I'm interested in what Sonoma County's vision is, right? And if I look across this room, what I see is an amazing plethora of resources, both human, organizational, and otherwise, that can do what we need to do in this community to own our future. It's kind of crazy. You think about this. Look at all these people in this room. First of all, I want to ask my, my colleagues to raise their hands. Shirley Zane, thank you for your leadership last year. Raise your hand. David Rabbit, Linda Hopkins, Susan Gorin, raise your hands. Hold your hands up. Please, hold your hands up. These guys, we are a dysfunctional, amazing family. <laughs> council members, raise your hands. If you're a mayor or a council member, raise your hands. Thank you for what you do. This is our year where we fight in the face of saying that the county and the cities don't work well together. All this crap that goes on. It's time for us to get beyond it. It's time for us to get back to a we. Tribal leaders, I look over, I have my good friend Reno Franklin, chair of the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians. Thank you for being here. All those in the business sector, raise your hands. Nonprofit sector, raise your hands. Todos que quieren una comunidad bien integrada, levanta la mano. Hold your hands up for one second, everybody in this room, and look around at those around you. Look at those people around you. Give them a high five. <laughs> the reason I say this is because you know what? Those that are in this room and those people in the community, it's all we've got. That's all we've got. And we got this. We are the ones who have to confront here in Sonoma County and throughout our state, our nation, everywhere, generational shift like we haven't seen in a long time. Climate change, the age of acceleration, digital acceleration and reviews going faster than we ever thought imaginable, economic inequality, and yes, natural disaster, right? Natural disaster. October 8th taught us a lot. 110,000 acres of our beautiful Sonoma County, this place we call home, this place that we love to live, work, and play, burnt down. 7,000 structures, 5,000 homes, 10,000 of people still displaced, 100,000 plus displaced during those fires. 24 members of our community are no longer with us. There's a lot of pain in our community right now. As much as we have excitement about the future and we love to be innovative and grandiose in how we be leaders and the point of the spear on what's coming in the future, there's a lot of pain in our community. I was with a guy the other day, corner of Brighton Court in Larkfield, Wikiup, Earl, who left four messages on my phone, right? First one said, God, thank you for for responding to my call. I'm really hoping we can get this done. Second one said, 
Thank you for connecting me with the Army Corps and the contractors. We're seeing progress. Third one said, I haven't heard anything. F you, F everybody, I'm out of here. Fourth one said, thank you for making the call back. They called me today, it's happening. Fifth one said, thank you for stopping by my lot when they were clearing it and having a beer with me at 6 p.m. My family thanks you. I don't say that because of anything of me. I say it because people are going through hell right now. They're busier than they've ever been. They're more stressed than they've ever been. Price gouging is going on. Insurance problems here and there. I mean, it is an intense time. And these people who are dealing with all this stress don't have homes. It is a crazy time. We have two bookends that we need to stay towards, right? Number one is don't fail these people. Tens of thousands of people. Number two, own the future. Make sure that we're ready next year for the next fire that comes. So we're not like what happened as we look over the hill in Lake County where three successive years of dominant fires. Make sure we own the future so that if the floods come on the lower river next year, we're ready. Make sure that we're ready with the best of technology, alerts, going out to people, letting them know what's going on. Make sure we get back to basics, grazing our landscape, controlled burning, seeing fire not as disaster but as a resource, as an ecology, as a part of what we live with. We fight that and it owns us. We work with it, we own it. Today's State of the County is not going to be about me and my vision, it's going to be about we. You're going to hear from amazing cross-section of folks. I have the mayor of Santa Rosa who's going to be the first of those. We have about four individuals who are going to come on after that, show us the vast diversity of what we have, where we were, where we're going, what are our challenges. The last thing I want to leave you with before I introduce the mayor, though, is when we raised our hands and we said, this is all we've got to confront all of these issues, at the same time, I look back to uh, this poem that somebody sent me from June Jordan, and it's called, We Are the Ones We've Been Waiting For. I say that not as a way to stand before you and try to inspire you today. Like as if I have some magical power or any of us do as council members, leaders, to tap you and give you some kind of a magic to set you afire, pun intended. I don't sit here before you to inspire you. I ask to have us create the kind of partnership and collective impact that we need to do to uncap each other and to unleash what we can do here in Sonoma County. And the reason I say that is because before these fires, our need was collective impact. And that is not kumbaya, let's get together and have more talks make more combined plans. That is an economic imperative of aligning resources, having similar agenda, having projected aim, measuring your progress, getting it done, right? That was a need on October 8th. It is an imperative now. It is an imperative. We have been knocked off of our first world problems. We got big stuff coming down the pipeline. And we need to use the combined brain trust and resources in this room to get it done. Because as I'm going to bed last night and I'm thinking about staying up late to try and write a perfect speech, then I kind of throw it aside. My kids wake up. They're like, Daddy, you know, please lay in my bed for five more minutes. I'm like, no, 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 come on, please, please, please. And I'm like, get your head straight. Get your head straight, Jimmy, right? I go down and I lay with Jacob and Opal, and then Elizabeth comes in, and it's just magic. And I refuse to subscribe those kids to a pessimistic future. That is crap. I'm tired of the doomsday scenarios and the apocalyptic visions. We all are as supervisors. That's why we work our butts off. That's why you do what you do. But in Sonoma County, we have a great thing an amazing innovation, an amazing sense of place, an amazing ability to take what is already an example from the state 
and use that fire to bur that burned us to forge resolve. And collective impact is the way that we need to do it. We don't have to agree on everything. It doesn't have to be full competition or full cooperation. Cooperation is okay for now, okay? So I look to you not just to have 600 people, leaders, come here and be glossy-eyed bystanders and be listening and hearing things, but we're gonna go through an amazing plethora of community leaders, then we're gonna go into breakouts. They're only an hour, we're not gonna figure out the world, but don't go into these breakouts and talk about problems. Put your resources on the table, talk to somebody, do something, use the brain capacity in this to figure out what you can leave here from with one, two, or three follow-on items. We're gonna track to the end of the year to the California Economic Summit, that week of November 15th and 16th, I want us to try and make this our version of South by Southwest, our version of owning the future. I need you to do that. I can't do that. I, me, my, mine, those are very lonely words, okay? We are the ones we've been waiting for. Chris Corsi, Mayor of Santa Rosa, please give a round of applause for a great leader who is my partner and our partner. Let's have some fun today. Good morning, everybody. That's right, he said Mayor of Santa Rosa. It may sound a little dissonant at this event, which is the state of the county. But the state of the county right now is no business as usual. It has to be. James asked me to come here today to put a little exclamation point on that to let you know that we're not going to do things the way they've always been done as we get through this very challenging time. The intent here for me is to let you know a little bit about how Santa Rosa uh, is responding to the fire and what our recovery plans uh, are in a very general way. But it's also to talk about the city's and the county's efforts to work together, our commitment to cooperate and collaborate as we go through this time. As James very eloquently said, we know that we're stronger when we work together. The city and the county have been doing that for several years on certain levels. The annexation of Roseland was, was a great example of that. Over the past year, we've been working on aligning up our homeless services and now, more than ever, we need to work together in the aftermath of this fire. The events over the past few months have forever changed our community. When you look at the scope of the devastation, the loss of life, the emotional and physical tolls that these fires have taken, the destruction of 5% of Santa Rosa's housing stock, this situation can appear grim, but at the same time, this is what makes Santa Rosa and Sonoma County the great place, the special place that it is. Our residents and businesses, our nonprofits, our neighboring cities, elected leaders, and our great staff have shown their determination not only to recover from the disaster, but to seek opportunities to make a better future in this community. In the early days after the fire, both the city and the county took action to help ensure our fire survivors have an expedited path to rebuilding. In Santa Rosa, we opened our Resilient City Permit Center. We did that in late November. It's a separate department created exclusively for fire survivors who are rebuilding. And by lowering fees and by cutting our city's bureaucracy, we're seeing the initial residential rebuild permits turned around in a matter of days. We've created new, new tools and resources to help guide our residents and their contractors through the building process. As of yesterday, 1,700 people has, had visited our rebuild center at City Hall. We've had 1,200 phone calls. We're now about 16 weeks from the onset of the fires, and I'm encouraged to say that rebuilding is happening in Santa Rosa. Ten residential building permits have been approved. Many more are under review. There's a house 
There's a house that has risen in Coffee Park. <laughs> this is just a small start to what's a monumental effort. But seeing those walls and windows of a new home go up in one of our devastated neighborhoods is a visual inspiration. And it says, we can and we will do this. Now there's no doubt that our community is going to face struggles in the coming years. We're far from being out of the woods at this point. And every day, every time we solve one problem, it seems like another complication pops up. But as we deal with these complications, we also have to keep seeking out opportunities to keep moving forward as a community. As I tell our staff every day, we need to walk and we need to chew gum. In the days following the fires, the city and the county partnered effectively to put together a joint effort to aid our community through crisis. Now, we need to work together to build for the future. We don't want to get five, five years down the road, 2022, 2023, and, and celebrate that we are back to 2017. We need to move forward. And with that in mind, We've convened a committee of council members and supervisors and staff from not just our two governments, the city and the county, but from the Sonoma County Transportation Authority, the Regional Climate Protection Authority, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, Sonoma Clean Power, and other agencies. We're calling it Build and Rebuild, BARB, for those of you who like acronyms, <laughs> to emphasize that we need to help we need to keep our foot on the gas to build new housing at the same time we're helping people rebuild what was, what's gone from the fires. This is critical work, but we need to do more. We had a housing shortage prior to the fire. And Santa Rosa had implemented our, implemented our housing action plan. The goal of that was to build 5,000 new units in seven years. A year after we adopted that plan, we lost 3,000 units. Okay, so now the number is 8,000 for Santa Rosa. We need many thousands more countywide. These are daunting numbers. We know that. They can only be achieved through forward-thinking solutions and with participation across the region. This is not just a city problem. It's not just a county problem. It's all of our problem. We as leaders need to be bold right now. But we also need support from all of you, from our entire community, if we're going to succeed. It's my hope that in the near future, you'll hear the city and the county leaders talking about innovative ways to join together to finance and facilitate exciting new development in downtown Santa Rosa. We believe our downtown with its infrastructure, its access to transit, its many opportunities for green infill development, our downtown is the best place to make significant progress toward all of our housing goals. We envision mixed use, mixed income projects that leverage city and county property to not just build housing, but to enhance transit, bring jobs to our community, stimulate the local economy, and aid in the fiscal recovery of both the city and the county. We can't do this unless we're working together. Chair Gore and I believe that this is the time that demands real collective work for a big collective impact. And we invite all of you to join us. I know that this community has the resources, the brains, the will, and the grit to get this done. So are you with me? Let's get to work. Thank you. I'm with you, Mayor. I'm with you. We were talking the other day, and there was this amazing quote that came up, or statistic. It said that with the loss of our housing stock, we are probably, on just the affordability side, 17,500 units behind where we need to be. 
up until about 2013 and those, that kind of time frame, we were building 500 units a year in Sonoma County. And we have community separators and we have easements and we want to protect and we will refuse to build and sprawl out into other areas. But we have some laudable goals, not just rebuild five. I mean, come on. Don't want to scare you, but 20 plus, 30. There's people who are saying we're 90,000 units behind to be able to hold a workforce. Just a thought. Okay, so I uh, want to thank Dr. Jerry Nick Nicklenberg for coming here. Um, Jerry's been here for quite a few years. He's here to speak about this topic and our local economy. Uh, Jerry is the director of the UCLA Anderson Forecast. He's right over here. I'm going to talk about something about him. I'm trying to find something fun. I was like, come on, Jerry, give me something good. He says, ask Ben. I said, what do you mean? You and Ben buddying up? Is that why you get this contract every year? Anyways, Jerry does an amazing job of uh, going all around the state and the nation, accurately, accurately predicting many of our state's economic fluctuations. He's a native of Santa Rosa. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, PhD Minnesota, faculty UCLA for the past 12 years. Warm Sonoma County welcome. Bring it on. Thank you, and it's always a pleasure to be back here and, uh, and, and drop the microphone. And, and that's right, native of Santa Rosa, I spent my first few years on this planet on Slater Street in Santa Rosa. It was good times, I just had to eat and sleep. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back here, and um, what I want to do today is change a little bit the way in which I do the economic outlook and start by talking about Sonoma County. Uh, you've heard uh, a number of the issues about rebuilding, and what I'd like to do is give you some uh, backdrop, some historical experience of, of what has happened in uh, other communities in rebuilding based on some research that I've done, uh, the EDB and your uh, local leaders have been moving rapidly and, and you've kind of heard the challenges and I want to echo that and show you some data on that. Uh, so the program for today is to talk about the soaring Sonoma County economy and that's good news that's great news, but it also presents some challenges uh, in the rebuilding. And so talk about the economics of recovery, then turn to the U.S. outlook and a little bit about the tax bill and what it's going to do. Uh, the California outlook and some risks and return to a Sonoma County forecast. So let's begin with uh, unemployment and unemployment in Sonoma County, as you know, is extraordinarily low. The reports in the press said it's the lowest in about 16, 17 years. But if you look at this diagram, uh, there are only a couple of months in the past 30 years when unemployment has been lower. And that just kind of dropped down and back up. So this is extraordinarily low unemployment. And instead of the unemployment line, it's looking to hire. And that's a critical issue as you all go forward in these next uh, couple of years. Uh, there's also record employment levels. It's not, as in some places, low unemployment because there's, there are people who are discouraged and out of the labor force. There's highest employment levels ever in Sonoma County. So that's good news. Uh, and that means that since the depth of the, the recession, 15% growth in employment. But when you get to these record employment levels and record low unemployment, there isn't a pool of idle labor to, to draw on. And so th the latest numbers show you nine tenths of a percent increase in employment, a dramatic kind of slowing in the growth of employment. And if we just look around the state, so this is regional employment growth last 12 months, the 
Green is Sonoma, the rust brown is the US. Uh, what's happening around the state is most areas of the state that have been lagging behind, they're the ones that are growing faster than, uh, than the US. San Francisco and Silicon Valley still growing faster, but only at about half the rate that they were growing. And, and then Sonoma now with uh, this very low unemployment, growing much slower than the US. And again, that's because the resources are, are not here to grow faster. Uh, now, why is San Francisco and Silicon Valley also with low unemployment able to grow a bit faster uh, in, in their um, uh, in, in employment because they're also high cost of living areas? Well, you can see that from here. This is the distribution of jobs in San Francisco, which is red, uh, Silicon Valley in blue, and Sonoma in green. And it's just a very different constellation of jobs. In Sonoma, uh, you have on the, on the left, you have uh, farming, non-durable goods manufacturing, which includes uh, uh, beverage production, and, uh, and tourism and retail are more dominant. And over on the right, you've got San Francisco and Silicon Valley, where tech is more dominant. Tech tends to hire much uh, higher income uh, individuals, individuals who can afford more easily the higher cost of housing. And that's why even though the growth rate is slowing, and we expect it to slow much more, it's still higher than the US today. But there's uh, a change coming as of January 1. There's a new industry that Sonoma County is uh, uniquely positioned to take advantage of. And it's gonna involve tourism as well as farming and non-durable goods manufacturing. So I found this picture, tourism, uh, marijuana tourism in Colorado is a big deal. And this is a, a van, and, and it says on it, um, oh, now I, oh, t uh, tell you right, Mary Jane Tours. And, and then the, what you can't read at the top is, is, is their tagline, the highest tour in Colorado. <laughs> so that's coming here to California, maybe here to Sonoma. But this is an issue, and it's an issue that you, you've heard about many times. The price of housing in Sonoma County is now at record levels. It's above that which was experienced during the housing bubble. But it's not a housing bubble now. It's a housing shortage. And so that's a critical issue in increasing the labor force. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that uh, as I go through this. So a little digression on some histor I'm going to show you three historical instances of recoveries or the lack thereof from natural disasters. The picture here is of the Oakland Hills 20 years later uh, after they suffered that uh, devastating fire and tragedy, uh, completely rebuilt. Uh, but as I think the mayor said uh, correctly, this is 20 years later in Oakland Hills and 20 years is really way too long. So just taking you through a couple of these, this is the big earthquake in Anchorage. Uh, it was a magnitude 9.2 in 1964. Uh, and, but some characteristics about the Anchorage economy. It's a small economy, it's an isolated economy. About half of the economy was dependent on military spending, which was completely unaffected by the earthquake. But then what happened? Uh, what you see here are two lines, a green line and a red line. The green line is uh, what I projected would be income in Anchorage had the earthquake not occurred. And the red line, income, the actual income, what, what really happened. And if you look at the difference, Anchorage didn't recover. And they still haven't recovered. They, they didn't have the resources, they were isolated, they couldn't draw resources in, and and so the economy shrunk and it stayed that way. Now let's turn to another one. This is Japan, and this is the uh, great Hanshin earthquake. It was in Kobe, uh, massively destructive because it was in a major uh, city, an area of, of over five million people. And what happened there? They had rapid recovery. The red line is actually above the green line. 
Uh, it drops below, but it dropped below because of the 1997 Asian financial crisis, not because of anything that was actually happening in, in Kobe. What's the difference between those two? The difference was that after the Kobe earthquake, Japan mobilized resources. It brought in from outside uh, construction workers to rebuild, and they rebuilt, rebuilt rapidly, and it added new capital stock. And so you get a full recovery in a short period of time. And that's really a key difference. So we'll take just a quick look at one more, which is Katrina. And uh, because there's something instructive about Katrina here, uh, we, we kind of all know the, the story about Katrina, but so let's look at you know, what actually happened. Uh, the red line drops below the green line. Not much recovery. Actually, there's still not a recovery to today. But there's one point there where that red line comes up to the green line, and that is 2007. What's instructive here is that in 2007, the housing market uh, w was taking a very deep dive here in California, right? Construction was drying up, and construction workers were being laid off. And in particular, the first construction workers laid off were undocumented immigrants. They didn't have a safety net. So they looked around and said, okay, so where can we work? Oh, they need a lot of housing in, in New Orleans. And you saw a massive outflow of undocumented construction workers from California to New Orleans. That's what's happening there. And then, of course, the 2008 recession, and that all ended. It's instructive, and in, in, in the, in the Hanjin earthquake is instructive because communities don't have standby resources to draw upon when they have unexpected disasters. And you have to bring in those resources from outside. And the housing issue that uh, we just talked about, that's, that's kind of critical of finding housing and mobilizing resources from outside the economy. So an economy that's doing very well, but this is a challenge that, um, th that is coming up in order to grow and, and to build on the resiliency that's here, but to grow and recover rapidly. Okay, so I just said that. And let's go on to the US. And uh, so I've got two things here. One is just chaos in Washington, and there's a whole list, uh, but I did this last week, and the list changes every day. <laughs> uh, but I kind of like this picture from the Atlantic where Uncle Sam is just kind of cowering in a corner saying, enough, I'm just exhausted. <laughs> and then on the right-hand side is, um, Th this is the turtle Sunday, supposed to be the world's largest Sunday. You can buy it in Chicago. You can't eat all of it, but you can take bets on that. Uh, and that's about the sugar high that we're about to go on in the US economy. So let's just take a moment for uh, GDP growth calculus. Uh, so what goes into GDP? One of the things is labor force. We've got a full employment economy, and we're trying to through immigration policy, make sure that the labor force doesn't grow very fast. Uh, changes in technology, productivity went down in the fourth quarter of last year. We've been in kind of a productivity slump, and the third part of getting the economy to grow is new capital stock. And that's what the tax bill is really all about. That's the way it was sold. Lower corporate taxes, get new capital stock, and grow the economy that way. Uh, but the tax bill is going to result in an increase in the deficit. And there's a debate about how much. We're fairly conservative in, in our estimates. And what you see here is that the deficit grows, then it kind of shrinks a little bit, and then grows again. And the shrinking a little bit is because of taxes that are paid on repatriated uh, funds from US corporations that are being held abroad. But what that means is the federal government's going to have to borrow more. And in a tight economy with full employment and uh, with, uh, with inflation at 2% or above, the Federal Reserve will be normalizing interest rates. The Fed is also selling off some of its massive portfolio that it gained during the Great Recession. And so we're going to see interest rates go up. Now, you look at this and you say, well, the short rate is about 3%. The long rate 
is about 4%, that long rate is the top line, and that's pretty high, but if you have a, an inflation rate of 2%, these are still fairly low interest rates, but they're higher than today. Uh, and so the implication of that is that they are going to discourage some auto sales. Auto sales in January were down. Uh, they're also down because automobiles that were lost in the Gulf hurricanes have now been replaced, and so the demand is going down. So we have this increase in consumer purchases of a durable good that's now declining. Same thing is gonna be happening with homes. Uh, so in the US, we're gonna have increase in home building, but then it's gonna start declining as we get into 2019 with higher interest rates, uh, hi higher interest rates making homes more expensive. Uh, equipment spending, and this is really one of the places where the new tax bill uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, bites here, uh, and, and, and that is in equipment spending. So the idea is for the tax bill to increase investment, and that's exactly what we expect it to do. And one of the provisions that I think is key here is expensing. So expensing says if you buy new equipment, you can take, it, take depreciation against your taxable income of 100% in the first year. And if you don't use all of that, you can carry it over. That's going to induce firms to invest today and to do investments today that they would have done in 2019 and 2020. And we used to have a, a provision called the investment tax credit that would always come on when a recession happened. And you would see as we got close to a recession, uh, companies would stop investing because they wanted to get the investment tax credit. And that pullback of investment was part of the reason why we got those recessions. So now what we're doing is we're pulling back investment into 2018, means this year is gonna be a, a, a pretty good year, but that's investment that was going to occur in 2019 and 2020. So again, things are kind of being front loaded here. And that's the sugar high. Uh, so we're going to get an increase in GDP. Uh, I, we're just about where consensus is amongst uh, forecasters in kind of the mid threes this quarter. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta thinks it's gonna be higher than that. Uh, but then it, it really kind of tails off here uh, because of all of those things that were pulled into 2018 that won't be there in 2019. We're not predicting a 2019 recession, but we're gonna go under 2% growth. So we're, we're kind of buy, borrowing from the future un unless we can continue to uh, pump the economy with more sugar, but more likely it's gonna be a sugar crash when we get to 2019. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this. But what that means is that unemployment is gonna go below 4% this year, but then, then as the economy stops growing quite so fast, it'll go back above 4%. Uh, and it does mean that we're gonna get good wage growth. And the, and the latest numbers that came out this morning, 3% uh, on an annualized basis wage growth in January. So good wage growth finally in the economy. So the US outlook, we've got forecast risks, failure of NAFTA talks, China trade war, geopolitical events, and then we have some sectors that are out of balance. Retail is certainly one of them, and maybe there's some others. So these are kind of risks to keep our eye on, uh, things that could cause the forecast to go awry. So now, let's do a little myth busters. And the myth is that low taxes equal economic growth. And we hear this a lot. So let me just show you a slide here so this would be the Mythbusters slide. This is state GDP performance for states with population greater than five million. This is the last five years. Uh, all the states there are in blue except for the Golden State, which is in gold. And, uh, and you notice that it's number two. And if you look across the states there, uh, you have states like Minnesota and California that have high taxes, and states like Texas that have low taxes. And if you just take the Tax Foundation's indicator of business-friendly states and do a correlation, 
what you would predict here is that the more business unfriendly a state is, the faster it grows. Well, I mean, that correlation is a little bit spurious, but the point is there are many other things that influence economic growth than taxes, and we don't have any empirical evidence that taxes really spur economic growth. There are instances where they do, but mostly not so much. In California, so this is really business unfriendly state, we have record employment. Uh, the top line is total employment and it includes uh, the self-employed and farm employment and we're at 9% above our previous uh, trough. For payroll employment, we're about 10% above. So we've been growing rapidly and we continue to grow rapidly. In December, which is the last month that we have numbers for, uh, we had very good job growth in the US one-third of all those jobs were created in California. Uh, but the unemployment rate has been declining. We're now insignificantly different from the national unemployment rate because we've had that rapid job growth. And what's happened is uh, where we were at over 40,000 jobs a month, we've now dropped in the last two years to about 30,000. And that's because in California, we're confronted with exactly what you're confronted with here in Sonoma, which is a constrained economy because there just aren't many people sitting on the sidelines waiting for labor markets to, to tighten and to become, uh, uh, to become sufficiently good to enter the labor market. They are sufficiently good for everyone to enter the labor market who is looking for employment. Uh, and one way to measure that is to measure the, uh, the employment to population ratio. This is of the working age population. Uh, when you see in the federal pronouncements about employment to population ratios, uh, they include people above 64. They include people above 100 who probably are not looking for a job. Uh, so I stop it at 64, but if you just look at the trend in the employment to population ratio here in California, we're above that trend and, and, we, and, and it keeps going up. Uh, home building, I, you saw that home building in the US was, was turning down in uh, 2019. We don't have that in California because we have a constrained housing supply. We've got a, a robust demand for housing. And, uh, and so we have it going up, but not going up by quite as much. Now there've been some uh, regulatory changes, just as you have regulatory changes here in Sonoma to spur housing, there are regulatory changes statewide, and it may, in fact, be going up faster than that. But we've got a pretty solid trend now that takes us back to about where we were in 1999 and 2000. So the forecast for California, uh, we have employment growth that is slowing but it slows to about 1.2%, that's still faster than the US. Uh, and we have uh, unemployment rate dropping to 4.6%, may go under that uh, in the coming year. We've got a new forecast coming out in December, and I'm expecting that forecast to show a lower unemployment rate, but not much lower. And then uh, personal income growth, faster than the US, uh, we produce high value added products here in California, and that generates good income growth. And then housing starts getting up to 121,000. I think it'll probably go a bit higher than that. So now turning uh, back to Sonoma County, our forecast for economic growth is at 2.8%. So you notice that's slower than the state but that's because employment growth is also slower than the state. And, and if you kind of do the division on per capita income growth, actually Sonoma's per capita income growth will be higher than the state average. Uh, but again, the issue is, uh, the, the issue and the policy challenge, which you've uh, heard earlier this morning, which uh, EDB has been working uh, diligently on, and, and you're going to hear a lot more about today, is you know how do you translate that uh, resiliency that exists here in Sonoma into not just 
continued solid economic growth, but also a recovery and, and uh, creating uh, that bright future. And that's, uh, you know, part of that challenge, which I've tried to illustrate, is a constrained labor force and obtaining resources to, to actually make this happen. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, I think the outlook is, uh, is, is clearly very bright for Sonoma going forward. Thank you. You know, uh, we're very lucky. The Anderson School that uh, forecast that Jerry represents is the most uh, respected forecast in the state and, and, and in many ways the nation. So we're very lucky to have Jerry come up here. Also, Jerry has just been appointed as the director of the Anderson forecast. So it's a very prestigious position. So thank you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now I'd like to bring our supervisor and his panel up to the stage for their panel discussion. James? I saw everybody when um, he talked about correlation between higher taxes and growth go, you can't say that in a group of politicians. As Linda likes to say, Linda Hopkins, uh, what is it? Uh, correlation does not equal causation. Anecdote is not, or the plural of anecdote is not data. And what's a third? Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, I think, is how it goes. Thank you very much. I think what we're going to do right now is do a quick little change out. We're going to move this podium, have some folks come up and do some introductions. Take just a minute. Thank you. So um, going on our theme of really having the state of the county be about the true state of the county, the true unadulterated state of the county, not just what... My vision in as the glorious chair of the Board of Supervisors, which is actually a great opportunity to work and empower my colleagues and all of you. This is where we get a lot of our community members, um, activists and others up to talk about where we were post pre-fire, where we are now post fire and where we need to go. Um, it's an awesome opportunity. I don't know if anybody announced it earlier. I did just see uh, District Attorney Jill Ravage. Thank you for being here today. I appreciate it. Um, round of applause for Jill. She's done an amazing job. I want to thank uh, people who are running for office. I saw Ernie Oliveris, who's running for sheriff, and I also saw uh, Mark Essick, who's running for sheriff. I want to thank you all for stepping up into public service. Round of applause, everybody. It takes a lot of gumption to do this. As I take, say with politics, you don't get yin without yang, you know? You get in, you have purpose, you have a desire to serve, and then you get a whole lot of other stuff thrown at you. So as one person put it pointedly, as uh, she looked at me and uh, Sonny Wright, I don't know if some of you know her, she was an amazing elected official for many years, and she said, I just want you to know, know something, young man. It's not <laughs> thick skin, it's scar tissue. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about what we have going on in Sonoma County. This is our opportunity to talk about the collective impact from the side of nonprofits, from the side of all of our diversity, our tribal members, our governments, our sovereign nations coming together from the private sector and from, once again, the issue of equity in our community, how we rise up and not have economic stratification create social stratification. It is an amazing opportunity. I want to introduce these people. Beth Brown, raise your hand. It says Elizabeth here. Most people call you Beth. Uh, she is the president and CEO of the Community Foundation for Sonoma County. Uh, Reno Franklin. Reno is the chair of the Kashaya Band of Pomo Indians. Uh, also was very integral in creating something called the United Pomo Nations Council. Brings together uh, different bands of the Pomo Nation from up and down a wide variety of counties. Reno's also a White House appointee on cultural resources from the last administration through to this administration. He's doing a great job for us. As he says, he was furloughed yes. last week. Uh, Brett Martinez. Brett, we all know you. Um, I think one of the reasons that we asked Brett to be up here is, is quite honestly, because RCU is a great business in this community. Yes, you do the recovery fund, but there are certain people who step up into a leadership role, and we really think of you as a leader in the business community, and it's what's the integration going forward. In Anna Lugo, president of North Bay Organizing Project, uh, one of the founders, co-founders in that first meeting uh, about three days into the fires of UndocuFund, um, a great 
smart activist on equity and in the right way, where we need to go, challenge us. I want to thank you. Finally, we have a moderator, Jim Mayer. Jim is a dear friend of mine. He's the executive director, president, chief operating officer, chief <coughs> executive officer, <laughs> president of the free world of something called California Forward. If you don't know, you should. It's something I'm addicted to. It was created during the recession. Uh, about three different organizations and foundations came together and focusing on what is the future, the nonpartisan future of California. Where do we need to be? They have led ballot initiatives that presented the top two tiers, that presented citizens redistricting, all kinds of stuff that have empowered regionalization, regional economies and budget, have been a great not just think tank, but do tank. They are the co-hosts of the California Economic Summit. Um, I have been to that the last three or four years. A lot of the people in this room have participated in that. You're gonna get a real good opportunity to participate in it coming later this year. We get to host the California Economic Summit, not just as Sonoma County, but what we wanna do is host it as a region, host it as the North Bay, understanding that not just fires show us that jurisdiction doesn't matter, that four to five counties can be impacted in one, one fell swoop, but also that our issues of housing, workforce, natural resources, especially water, have no interest in where we draw our lines, okay? It's time to get things done. Jim, I wanna pass it over to you. Let's have some fun. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you, James. Thanks to your colleagues. And on behalf of California Forward and all of our partners in the California Economic Summit, uh, we're glad to be part of your journey. Uh, and we're grateful to be working with you. We're going to hear some stories this morning um, about your response to the fire as part of this journey of capturing those lessons learned so that you can be better prepared. You know, if you think back, uh, the things you did in those first few hours, uh, maybe the first few days, you did because of what you had done before, because of plans, because of preparation, <clears throat> because of experiences, because of relationships you had and trust you had built. Uh, and because of a legacy in Sonoma County around stewardship and cooperation, whether you recognize it and whether you call it that. And what I find particularly exciting isn't just uh, to look back at the lessons learned during the, this recovery and figure out how to be better prepared for the next disaster, which we all know in California is gonna hit us eventually. It's about trying to figure out how to capture that sense of urgency, that adrenaline-filled sense of urgency, that over-the-top generous spirit of cooperation, and that realization that you are all in this together, and that tomorrow isn't guaranteed, and distill that, incorporate it into everyday life in Sonoma County. To take the extraordinary and put it into the ordinary so that you can get done what you want to do beyond this recovery. Now, uh, I'm going to just set a little bit of context, and then we're going to hear these stories from, as, as James said, representatives of the different sectors. And I want to just lay a framework for this idea of collective action. And one of the primary ones is that it does require cooperation, communication, and if we do it right, collaboration between all three of the primary sectors, because, between the public sector, the private sector, and the civic sector. And there's many reasons why this is true, but let me just touch on three that I think are kind of common denominators that you'll all understand. The first is that each one of these sectors, as diverse as they are within them, have distinct contributions to make. They have different resources, they have different capacities, they've got different abilities to perform and to deliver. They have different authorities, both formal and informal, and we need them all. To, get, to do what you want to do, you can't do it with one of the silos alone. They all have to be working, and they have to be working together. A second is that they are mutually dependent. Some of us have spent a lot of our lives in the public sector don't have to remind ourselves that wealth comes from the private sector. The resources from the private sector, through taxes and through philanthropy, fuel what we do in the public and civic sectors. We need them. In turn, the good work of the public sector and the civic sector creates those conditions, including quality of life and equality of opportunity, that, that encourage and allow for additional private investment so that we can get into that virtuous cycle of investment and higher returns on in, that investment. And the third is, is that if we want wealth to grow over time, that means we have to improve productivity, which we do through innovation. Now, we oftentimes think of innovation only happening in the private sector, and oftentimes the private sector leads. 
But what we need is productivity gains and innovation in the public sector and the civic sector as well. Uh, and that is best happened when the sectors are working together so that they can learn from each other. They can deploy innovations from one and the other. They can adapt. They can work together and get those things done. So those are just three primary reasons why we need to be building stronger relationships and connectivity. Now, here in Sonoma County, you know this. Because in uh, my limited exposure to you, I've seen examples of innovation, collective efforts, collaborative efforts. And I'm just going to call out two, but I'm sure that you could put all kinds of examples up on this board. One of them is the Russian River Confluence, a relatively nascent but extraordinarily ambitious effort to bring public, private, and civic sector together to better manage your watershed um, because there's an intense interest, love, respect, compassion, and hope for the future in the Russian River itself. Because as Norman McLean says, eventually everything merges into one and a river runs through it. Now, another one that I'm, I'm particularly um, enamored with and have used in our other work is upstream investments, another effort where um, private sector partnered with philanthropy to figure out ways to drive change in the civic sector, service delivery, especially in social services, and then to migrate that into public spending. And you can see that that kind of collaboration would not have happened, that kind of innovation would not have happened without that kind of collaboration. Now I want to touch on one other trinity, if you will, that I think is very important to our collective effort. And that is that this, we've got to really adhere to a triple bottom line. Many of you, I think, in this room are aware of, cognizant of, the limitations of unrestrained capitalism, just as we are the limitations of unrestrained socialism or unrestrained social, uh, environmentalism. And it's really about coming up with a framework where we're accounting for all three and that we're advancing solutions that simultaneously move forward people, planet, and profit. This is not a new idea, but we've got a long way to go to be deploying this in the key decisions we're making in all three sectors, and especially when we're working together. Uh, you know, I think it's particularly important even in our own lives. I know that we think about this in my family and in our family business because uh, we think it as a focusing way around our decisions as stewards for our family, for our business, for our community, our region, and as we've been talking today, for your future. What do you want that to be? And how are you going to account it according to a triple bottom line? The triple bottom line is part of the DNA of the California Economic Summit. In fact, if you go to the um, in, Economic Summit website, backslash in, endorse, you can see the principles for the California Economic Summit. You can go there and you can endorse them because the hundreds and thousands of people who have been involved in this over the last seven years recognize that this is where we need to begin, that this isn't about growing profits. It isn't just about having a climate free, a, a, a carbon free cl uh, climate. It is, about, it is about bringing them together and advancing all three. It's, it's also embedded then in what we refer to as the Roadmap for Shared Prosperity. The 2017 summit in San Diego brought hundreds of people together in, in where they informed and then committed to specific actions they wanted to pursue in 2018 to pursue a set of things that were necessary for shared prosperity. Those things are memorialized in the 2018 Roadmap for Shared Prosperity, which was released yesterday and is also available at caeconomy.org. And the major elements are what we refer to as our one million challenges. We know we need to grow the housing stock by more than a million in California. What are we going to do in order to do that? We need to grow our skilled workforce by more than a million, and we're making progress in, at the state level and working with regions to build the CTE workforce pipeline. And we need more than a million acre feet every year for a decade in order to bring the state water into balance. And we need to do that primarily through regional resiliency and watershed management and integrity. And, and the Russian River uh, stakeholders have been key to our efforts in the summit to do that. We've also uh, incorporated, incorporated into the roadmap metrics and targets for restoring upward mobility and economic security. It truly does have to be a priority given where we are. We're connecting urban and rural California to each other. And finally, there's a dedicated stream of work here in Sonoma County, as well as in the other North Bay counties, to be documenting how, you're, how, how you are recovering, what, what would have enabled you to, res, to respond faster, what would build resilience in, into our communities, not just from disasters, but from economic dis, dislocations and other things that can impact the triple bottom line. And by November, when we come together for the summit, here in, in Santa Rosa and in other places within Sonoma County, 
uh, we'll have proposals developed for consideration here and by region, other regions about how we move that forward into state policy. So we've got a lot of work to do. You're well on the way. You're doing some wonderful things, and we're going to hear from some of those perspectives now. So Beth? So when we were in the hallway, the panelists, we were deciding if we should sit or stand for this part of the presentation, and we decided on sitting. But as I'm here, I realize my feet don't touch the ground. <laughs> and, and it's hard, as my niece, niece would say, to do serious adulting <clears throat> when you're like this. So I'm going to stand up. There you go. <laughs> On December 4th, I received a voicemail message, and it was this. Hey, Beth, it's Vanessa. Call me ASAP. I need to talk to you about the wildfires. <clears throat> well, that topic was not unusual. It's all we'd all been talking about for two months. But Vanessa was Vanessa Bechtel, the CEO of the Ventura Community Foundation. When I reached her, she said, we've just been hit by these wildfires. You're two months ahead of me. Tell me everything you know. And just like that, student becomes teacher. And something I knew nothing about two months prior, I was in a position to pay forward. So I thought with my five minutes today, I'd share with you the five lessons about disaster philanthropy that I'd shared with Vanessa that day. Lesson one, take the long view. Remember those early days? It's, each day was like a dog year. It was really hard to see beyond the urgency. There was so much need right in front of us. But as my team at the Community Foundation Sonoma County reached out to other communities and foundations across the country, who had experienced other disasters, some which were referenced in our presentation this morning, like Katrina or 9-11, or what seemed like countless hurricanes, we kept hearing the advice, you're gonna be in this for the long haul. Expect at least five to 10 years. If you can, in your fundraising efforts, set up, set up something that can be there for the mid to long term. You're gonna need some sustained philanthropic dollars. So we set up the Sonoma County Resilience Fund with that in mind for mid to long-term recovery. So far we've raised close to $11 million and we're working on our grant making strategy to make our first round of grants later this year. <laughs> Lesson two, expect extreme devastation and extreme generosity. When I gathered my team that first day, we set what I thought was a reach goal to raise one, raise one million dollars. We did that in two days. It wasn't because of us. It was that we underestimated the amount of generosity. We knew that here in Sonoma County, we'd be generous, but what we didn't expect was that over 70% of our contributions would come from outside our community, from around the region and around the country the tech industry stepped up, of course, the wine industry, the restaurant industry. And it wasn't just us. We're so lucky here to have the leadership of Brett Martinez and his team, who raised over $30 million for immediate relief. We're also fortunate to have the leadership of Daniel Lurie and the Tipping Point community, who raised millions of dollars on our behalf and did so by so boldly throwing two huge concerts. So collectively, we have tens of millions of dollars of philanthropic money, which is a lot, but our problems are in the billions. So we have a big responsibility to figure out how to invest really strategically. <laughs> Lesson three, support your second responders. Soon after the emergency workers had left the scene, our nonprofit sector, the second responders, stepped in <clears throat> to provide direct programs and services shelter, food, basic needs. These are organizations that were already stretched doing their main missions. And now they've taken on fire recovery work and programming as well. So it's our responsibility as we move forward to support not just the fire recovery work they're doing, but were, were their day jobs and their missions prior to the fires. Lesson four. Watch out for a tale of two. Unfortunately, in both our community and in our country, we are divided, a place of inequity. We know this locally. We have the data from the study we did, A Portrait of Sonoma, a few years ago. 
We know that sadly, sometimes your zip code can be more determinant of the quality of your life than your genetic code. In disaster situations, this contrast becomes even sharper. So we have a responsibility to pay more attention to the more vulnerable and to bring more resources to those communities, including low-income seniors and kids, communities of color, or new immigrant population. We're really lucky to have UndocuFund sprung up in their leadership to support the fire recovery. My final lesson, lesson five, is a little bit more of a personal one, which is take a breath and a nap. <laughs> Around that two-month mark when I was talking to Vanessa, I had been noticing that every meeting I was in was filled with energy, but it was the energy of adrenaline and caffeine. It was not that kind of sustained energy you need for a marathon pace. One of my favorite executive directors said that everyone on her team had gained the fire five. <laughs> I too remembered that I should re-examine and re-establish my relationship with salads. We know we have to be our own sustainable resources, and I know each one of you has been digging deep and contributing so much for the past few months. So one hope I have for you for your weekend is that you'll do something to take care of yourself, even as we do such a great job of continuing to take care of one another. Thank you. I don't, I don't have the same problem, but if I did, I would have stood too. Uh, I am required to stand because of who I am and the position I have within my own tribe. So with that being said, and Maya Iwa, Toshishki Mayenta, Reno County Franklin, Chairman Kashaya Pomo Tribe. And uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about the power of partnerships. And especially because we're all Sonoma County people, and as Sonoma County's first people, I think that we bring a different perspective and what these partnerships can bring to the table and the results that we can have from them afterwards. Um, a little bit about who Kashaya is. If you all have been to uh, Sea Ranch or to Fort Ross, welcome to Kashaya's territories. We are uh, on the coast in Sonoma here. And uh, archeologically, we can prove our existence on that coast for 12,500 years. Uh, we believe that uh, we first walked onto the earth at our village of Danaka right there at Stewart's Point. So we go back uh, in our way a lot longer than 12,500, but I think we pretty much got the deal sealed as far as who was here first. <laughs> 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 yeah. The county of Sonoma and the uh, Kashaya Pomo tribe have partnered for longer than a hundred years. Uh, there's a uh, last mass hanging in Sonoma County happened at a place called Plantation right on the coast and uh, three Kashaya men were uh, hung for the reason of being Indian in public and uh, when the telegram or telegraph went to the, uh, the sheriff of Sonoma County, um, the sheriff actually asked them to wait. I've always thought about that, and I think about our buddy Rob Giordano and what a great man he is and what a good job he's done for all of us. Thank you. We don't hear his name thrown out there because these guys were all so awesome and shining. Just, it, it takes a lot of the spotlight, but we gotta remember that Rob did that too. And the county sheriff still does that for my tribe to this day. We talk about partnerships. What do, what do partnerships with tribes look like? Um, let's talk about keeping our uh, beaches open. You guys remember last year the state, the state oh, tried to close our beaches and charge us money to go in and, and access them. And Kashaya stepped in and said, hey, wait a minute, those are our beaches. They've been our beaches since time immemorial, and we want to keep them free because we've always kept them free for everybody. And we own coastal land, and we're inviting people to come out to our property now, we're not charging them. So why would we support something like that? Uh, thankfully, that's gone. Doesn't exist anymore. And then we're talking about the Russian River. James has done a great job of pushing this Russian River alliance together. Um, and in doing that, has united a number of tribes as well. So we're talking to talk about the environmental aspect of the partnerships between tribes and the county. It's a beautiful thing. If done right, it's a beautiful thing. Did you know that at Stewart's Point, Kashaya has the very first Indian school in the state of California, right, right there on our reservation? And when that burned down, do you know who stepped in to help us with education funds? Yep, County of Sonoma. Still a county school. 
lots of Indian kids going to it. I love our kids. And lots of non-Indian kids that have gone through there as well. And we love, we love them all. And they all learn our language. And they all learn something about our ceremonies. It's how we pass these things forward. I think that probably the most beautiful collaboration between any government and a tribe can be the restoration of land, the righting of wrongs done in the past. And that certainly was done with the Kishaya Coastal Reserve. And this is a property that we worked with, not just the county, but with the state and a number of uh, private foundations as well. And uh, restored coastal land ownership to the Kishaya Pomo tribe. That 12,500 years that we've been on that coast, the last 150 of it, we've had to ask other people for permission to go until now. And the restoration of that is the most beautiful thing that the county has ever done for tribes. And we're very appreciative. And all of you at this table here and a lot of you out there had something to do for that. So we thank you. And every chance I get, I like to, to put that forward and make sure that everybody knows how appreciative the tribe is of such a beautiful action. So we have all these different ways that we partner together. And then the fires hit. And then it's the, the well, I can't say it, but Jimmy can. The O, S, and then little squiggly lines afterwards moment that we all had in October when all of a sudden these fires hit. And, um, and that felt to me, as a tribal chairman with a thousand tribal members, it felt an awful lot like I was on a boat and you could hear it creaking and the winds and the ocean was strong and rocking it back and forth and it's starting to leak. And then your brothers and your sisters come and your partners come and oh my God, Sonoma County at that point, we weren't black, we weren't white, we weren't Indian, we weren't Hispanic. We were Sonoma County residents, all looking to each other for help, all helping each other, irregardless of where you came from. Thank you. And I think that that is the key to these partnerships. And when you all are thinking of partnerships, whether it's economic development or, you know, or, or uh, housing, I really want you to think and be in the mindset of, you know, who are your partners? Where are these partners coming from? Amazing local, local push and, and leadership coming from Redwood Credit Union. Amazing leadership coming from our county. Where's the city of Santa Rosa, the mayor? Wow. And tribes, don't forget that when you think of partnering and you think of the power of these partnerships, build those relationships now. Because when you know what hits the fan, if I don't have a good relationship with my brothers and sisters from the county government, I'm out of that loop. And when that fire hit, and the Kishaya Pomo tribe was the only one at the, at the moment that could service Indians, not just Kishaya Indians, but Indians from 23 different tribes, and when it was all said and done, more than 3,000 people that came through our tribal offices that we were able to help with the assistance of other tribes like Lytton, and of the folks in the county, and of the amazing Mrs. Gore, which I'm waiting for the TV series. It's going to happen, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> but when so that happens, if those partnerships don't exist, this doesn't happen. I can't take care of my tribal members. I look, I look today, and I'm kind of looking back, and I'm thinking about Amber Idica and Sammy Pueyo, Cordova family, and you know people that I love and grew up with who have lost their homes, you know, in Car Coffee Park and Larkfield, and I. And I think about the response from the city of Santa Rosa and the ability for me to know that we have a good mayor in the city of Santa Rosa. By the way, I grew up on Orchard Street, Santa Rosa High School, go Panthers. <laughs> <clears throat> so in closing, I have a couple of statements that I want to make. And, and first of all, again, stress the, the importance of the partnerships with tribes, with your First Nations peoples, and with each other. And speaking of those partnerships, I get to do this little jab because I'm a little ticked off that I got furloughed. That's never fun. But uh, I want to say that the Kishaya Pomo tribe stands ready to partner with any of you, with our brothers and sisters from the county, with any of the uh, uh, tourism bureaus, city of Santa Rosa, um, to stand with you and to fight these efforts, these ill efforts to put oil rigs off of the coast of Sonoma County.
I think we have an opportunity now to show the Hill, to show Washington, D.C., that the people of Sonoma, not only are we strong, it, fires can't stop us, floods can't stop us, and certainly these misguided efforts from Washington, D.C. to damage our coastline forever, that won't stop us either. We will beat this. We can beat that together. If we partner together, these are the kinds of things that uh, we as individuals, as tribal leaders, county leaders, city leaders, that we can defeat. And I will close by saying in, in our language, Katin met tu dubi, chano lolowak, moch me. Me tu yibi kanem chedu. My brothers, my sisters, it is time to pray together. It is time to talk to one another. Thank you very much. So I'm going to follow suit, and I'm going to stand. So I've been asked to talk about a couple topics today. Um, over the past four months, I've had a lot of people asking me how Redwood Credit Union was able to do some, some of the things we've been able to do for our members, employees, and communities. And one of the things that people are unaware of is at 1.30 in the morning, on that Monday morning, we went into full disaster mode. Our main facility where our data center is, right there on Cleveland Avenue, the fire was coming towards that facility. We lost all power, we lost all phone lines, we were on backup generator. Uh, the building in that area was evacuated, we didn't have access to it. We had 150 employees spread all over Northern California because they were evacuated. Um, and we have about 300,000 members and in the four county area, we had several thousand members that were highly impacted and needed our services. The good news is our disaster plan that we work on on a regular basis and practice on a regular basis worked perfectly. Our services never stopped. We had to go to our backup uh, disaster center in, in Sacramento. And um, that I'm a big fan of disaster plans. I was, I'm a huge fan today because uh, it really saved, uh, saved the credit union and our ability to help our community. On Monday afternoon, I started getting phone calls asking us to um, uh, turn up our, our uh, community fund. And we had a lot of experience in the Napa earthquakes and quite a bit of experience up in Lake County in the two largest fires in our partnership with the Press Democrat and Senator McGuire. And the difference was we weren't in full disaster mode as a company at that time, so this was a, a huge, huge decision. The fact that we had the plan and the fact that I had confidence it was working and I had confidence in it because we had practiced it um, gave me the ability to feel comfortable. I knew it was going to be a, be a big deal. I didn't know it was going to be this big of a deal, but it uh, gave me the confidence to be able to um, say yes, and we were able to roll that fund out on the, the very next day on Tuesday. Wednesday of this week, our fund hit $32 million from over... From over 41,000 people and groups from 23 different countries. Over 70% of those dollars were from outside of the four county area, and this was a, a four county effort. It wasn't just Sonoma County. And each county has completely different uh, issues and needs uh, in, in, based on the disaster. Our fund is a very specific fund. Um, it's not designed for the medium and long term needs, it's, very, it's designed specifically to help those people who lost homes and had economic impact during the disaster. And as of uh, today, we will be cutting the final checks and by, uh, through the weekend, by Monday, all 32 million of those dollars will be dispersed to those people that uh, needed those funds. Um, so we will be in the process of shutting down that fund and really starting to focus on medium and, and the longer term issues from the credit union's perspective. But the reality is when you're receiving money from all over the world, how do you shut it down? So um, we're creating a process where we will link in each county based on the needs of that county, uh, any funds that come in after we, we shut it down to more of a medium term uh, recovery efforts. And then again, as our organization will focus on, on that at the same time. I'm very proud of what we've accomplished, but I wanted to take this opportunity. I know many of you in the room supported our efforts, and uh, it has been a crazy four months, and I appreciate your support. 
Ben talked a little bit about strategic Sonoma. Um, I'm not going to repeat what he said, but uh, Pam and, and I and our committee were working on a five-year strategic plan, and then the fires hit. And luckily, we were able to take a step back, and the Board of Supervisors gave us some additional funding, and we hired these uh, consultants, uh, strategy consultants that we had been working with, who really know Sonoma County at this point in time to go study other disasters and um, you know what worked and what didn't work, and they are uh, we're, we're getting ready to roll out a short-term economic uh, recovery plan, and then we'll jump back to the five-year strategy and and wrap that up. On day two uh, of the fire, uh, I hired a consultant for the credit union to go out and study different disasters and the impacts on credit unions and what they did to help their members and what they did to help their communities. And so the learnings from other disasters I, I, I find very valuable. Um, there's all kinds of things to learn and we really focused on those ones that recovered well. And I, I wanna talk about just a few, a few things. There's a, there's a lot of learnings, but a few I just wanna comment on. First of all, speed of recovery is very, very important. And um, you can't recover fast if you're not working as a team. It's been talked about here a little bit, partnerships. This is not government's responsibility. This is government, business, nonprofit, and our community uh, as a whole. We need to be working as a team. We need to be rowing in the same direction. And we need to be focused on what the goal is. The goal is rebuilding the community. The goal, the goal is helping those people that have been impacted. It's not about us individually. When there's a roadblock, there's gonna be roadblocks. Don't stop and stare at it. You go around it, you go over it, but don't stop and stare at it. One of the things that we've talked about in this community a lot uh, that is more important today than ever is doing business locally. And in a disaster situation, doing business locally is a uh, very important part of, of recovery. And small businesses are struggling here, and small businesses struggle in a disaster situation. These small businesses, many of them have been struggling since the, the first day of the fire, but they've had uh, you know, savings and that type of stuff. They are running out of runway right now. We know that because we've surveyed them and we've been talking to them. The quickest way that we can, we can help these people and, and help ourselves and help our community is to really as businesses and as community members to, to remember the power uh, that the uh, buying locally has. It's, it's, a, it's something that can change, change things tomorrow. So I have complete confidence in our ability to do this. And one of the reasons is I look around this room, I look up here on the stage, the leaders in this community, there's many of us are, are, are in the room today. And I have confidence in, because we have, we have a history of working together, I have confidence in our ability to do this. We're all in this together. And thank you for having me. stand just because I love to stand and because somehow I don't understand what this chairs who this chairs were created for but definitely not for a five foot three and a half person. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ana Lugo and I am the board president of the Norway Organizing Project, one of the founding organizations of Undocufan. I want to start by thanking Supervisor Gore for inviting me to speak this morning. I am very aware of the huge opportunity that this is. I must take a moment to acknowledge the responsibility I feel toward our communities in Sonoma County, who just like in our nation, have been rendered voiceless. And the giants whose shoulders I am standing on. They who have fought and dared greatly so that I can have a voice and the opportunity to stand on stage this morning. I am a young brown woman, and I am proud of it. A young brown woman with a vision. A vision where all people deserve housing, regardless of their income or life circumstances. <laughs> where every child has access to the best education, regardless of the color of their skin, the language spoken at home, or their parents' income. A vision where each and every one of us 
have the opportunity to pursue our dreams. I invite you to dream up a world where this vision is a reality. Now, I invite you to acknowledge how far we are from it. The divide that exists in our nation and in our communities. Yes, let us be honest with each other. We are divided by artificial determinants created long before us. Things like class, race, gender, sexual orientation. We are a microcosm of our larger society and we cannot change until we acknowledge that. And we have the opportunity to dare greatly and change that. I know we can. Because for the first time in my years working in this community, when the fires were burning, we all came together. If someone dropped the ball on something, the rest of us picked it up. No criticisms, no questions asked. We came together to ensure that everyone in our community had what they needed. Yes, there are many lessons to be learned and many improvements to be made. Divisions to be united. But I saw a glimpse of what we have the capacity to do as a community. The fires were equal opportunity, opportunity destroyers. They did not care for class, race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age. And it is our responsibility now to ensure that our systems and structures do not discriminate either. I needed that break. <laughs> One of the giants on whose shoulders I stand, Frances Perkins, was the first woman in the nation to serve in a presidential cabinet as a Secretary of Labor in 1933. She was America's leading advocate for industrial safety and workers' rights. Frances, who grew up in a conservative Republican home, understood her responsibility to ensuring that workers had safe working conditions. She understood this because on a fateful day, she witnessed workers, mostly young women, jump from the eighth floor to their deaths during the 1911 Triangle Factory fire. We too witness our neighbors running from the fires. We witness every day our community members suffer from homelessness, our families being displaced, our children going hungry, our immigrant families being terrorized. So I ask you, what is our collective responsibility as we see our most vulnerable suffer. Privilege is power, and power is nothing more than the responsibility to advocate on behalf of those who do not have it, to treat everyone with dignity and to respect them just like we like to be treated and respected. Here we are, a room filled with some of the most privileged and powerful people in our county. So I ask you again, what is our collective responsibility to the rest of our community? Will we allow greed to dictate the future of our, of our county? Or will we stand and stop the silence which, which, the, which oppresses so many of us? As Frances Perkins once said, the people are what matter to government and government should aim to give all people under its jurisdiction the best possible life. Woo! <laughs> the fires tested our character as a community. And if only for a few days, we surpassed the artificial divisions of our society and supported each other. We showed love to one another. Through our solidarity, we set an example, not only for our nation, but for the world. We now have the opportunity, and dare I say, the responsibility 
to be an example of what an equitable and just recovery can look like. I have the audacity to believe that together we can change our community, our nation, and the world. But we must ask ourselves, are we willing to dare greatly and stand up for one another? As President Obama said, our stories are singular, but our destinies are shared. Don't forget, our shared community is only shared if we remember the people we share it with. I can tell you this, if and when they come for you, I will stand with you. And I ask you this, if and when they come for me, will you stand with me? So as you've just demonstrated, this group needs no moderation. <laughs> you need no moderation. You know what to do. You are the leaders you've been waiting for. This is about turning, about turning opportunity into responsibility. It is about building and honoring and, and building on inclusion and diversity. That's not just a civil rights agenda. That is a resiliency agenda. You can do it. The California Forward, and California Forward and the Economic Summit will partner with you throughout this year to do this. Thank you very, very much for your work. Thank you. Wow. How about that for a state of the county? We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are all we have. And we got this if we do this. Some of you have heard me tell this story before. There's a, uh, an, a, a woman, um, God, Dr. Lori, can't remember her last name. Um, she presented to some of us recently. She called her Dr. Disaster. What was it? Lori Johnson. Lori Johnson, you ever want to see a book? It's, she as a researcher has done a report on six massive disasters and the research and how communities respond, which ones thrive, which ones dive, how it goes. She did this amazing presentation to a bunch of us one night. It was so full of research and methodology and empirical analysis and charts and schisms and other things and it was very enlightening. And then at the end of the day, she finishes her presentation, and one of us raises a hand and says, what's the one thing that you would advise outside of all this amazing data and research? What were the communities that rose out of catastrophe and disaster? And she just was saying, the ones that stayed together. It is so simple. It is so difficult to get out of our silos because our silos aren't because of who we are. They are because of our missions. They are what we are driving towards, not what we are avoiding. We are too damn busy to do damn good work sometimes. We are too damn busy. We don't allow ourselves to have the time to be innovative. Right? This is our opportunity. This is just a small glimpse into what we can do, but this is just a little glimpse. There's a lot of work. Collective impact starts with collective responsibility, Anna. We gotta own what we do. Leadership is about extreme ownership. Don't get to push off the things that you don't like. It's our time. We have a little video we're gonna show you. We are Sonoma County. Then we're going to break up into our groups. We have three rooms out here that are labeled, focused on the three areas of the triple bottom line. Productivity, sustainability, equity, and how we go forward as a part of that. What is coming before you and us this year? At the county, I want to tell you that on February 6th, we have a full day housing summit 
from our side of how we build towards a recovery and a resilience plan. The next Tuesday on the 13th, we hammer into economic response, productivity, thriving economy out of this, and then we also explore a second workshop, which is watershed protection. What we have done, what we need to do to make sure Montecito doesn't happen up here this year, Santa Barbara doesn't happen, what happens next year. Then we're going to move into February 27th, I, I believe is the last one of the year or excuse me, the last one of that month, that is going to focus on infrastructure. That is how do we work with a partnership with PG&E, our, our service providers and others, to underground utilities if we can in appropriate areas, to look at the grid of the future. That is also what's the infrastructure of disaster response? Where are we at with the technology of emergency learning systems and all these other things? That is also the infrastructure of how we push not just accountability on ourselves, but responsibility and accountability through our education with our community. The fact that we now live in a new normal, as Jerry Brown likes to say. The fact that as we recover from this catastrophe next year, it could be Windsor, and it could be Cloverdale, and it could be Rohnert Park, and it could be West County, and it could be the internal of Santa Rosa again. That is what we have to do. So when you go into these rooms later today, if you do so, don't think that it's going to be figured out, that in 45 minutes to an hour, you're going to have a facilitated session that's going to be perfect. God forbid. The only thing perfect from here forward is our imperfect, relentless progress, right? So take something out of today. Make a commitment to yourself, right? And after we show this video, we're not going to get back up and yap anymore. We're going to let you go over. Join this conversation if you'd like. If not, Find another conversation that you need to have, but commit to something. And what I ask you and challenge you is commit to not going back. Retraction, a.k.a. atrophy, into Saturday's mentality and Saturday's problems will basically put the kibosh on all of that amazingness, right? Hold on to that fire that burnt us. Turn it into something good. Don't extinguish it. We have a video I think we're going to show. And I want to thank you all for being here today. Absolute pleasure. Sometimes we only know what we're made of when we're tested. When everything we're doing is suddenly turned upside down. When what we wake up thinking the day would look like is not what the day holds. The beauty of these days is they show us what lives inside us. They show us what's possible. When all the categories drop away. When the notions of who is us and who is them disappear. And all that's left is a powerful sense of we. We are Sonoma County. Somos Sonoma County. We've proven we can come together, together, and be stronger. All of us have unique gifts and talents far beyond what we know. If only we can have the courage, courage, to offer what we have. I am Sonoma County. I am Sonoma County and I am hopeful. I am unwavering. We can find courage in the face of a stranger. We can find courage in the conviction of our ideas. And sometimes something unexpected happens and we rise to the challenge and see what we're made of. It doesn't matter how we come together, just that we do. Will it be easy? But we are Sonoma County. We've proven we can come together. Now, we just have to keep doing it. Proud to be Sonoma County. Yeah, we got this. <laughs>